Our next speaker is scheduled as Sergio Rossetti Morazzini. Um, Sergio had a painting commission today and he, his wife, Adele Rossetti Morazzini is reading his paper. Um, this was a very last minute thing, um, but appropriate since Adele was um, in the Pratt and Venice program like Sergio for three years in the early years of the program. So they came together and the third year they brought their kids. So um, they're very strong uh, Pratt and Venice members. As you can tell from the last name, Morosini, in relationship to the paper by Jesse, that's an old Venetian name of great distinction. So, um, you know, Sergio uh, came to Venice knowing Veneto dialect and that gave him entree to everything. So it was really a fun thing. Um, so I'm reading about Sergio. Sergio's um, <coughs> Rosetti Morzini, artist, naturalist, diplomat, filmmaker. Sergio is honorary senator from the state of Louisiana. He was in Venice 92, 93, 94, twice um, as a student participant and the third summer, a conservation intern under Vasco Fascina of the Venice Opening Tendenza. He graduated from Pratt with a dual degree um, of the M Master of Fine Arts with the Master of Theory, Criticism, and History of Art, Design, and Architecture. He is dedicated to the preservation of the Atlantic forest and the conservation of the art stone of New York City. Among his works is the bust of Michelangelo on the facade of the National Arts, the National Arts Club in New York City, uh, which is both a New York land, landmark and a National Historical Landmark. Sergio's research in Venice focused initially on fresco techniques, um, resulting in an art bulletin article, which was a discovery. And his paper today derives from that pioneering work, which will be read by his wife, Adele, who is also an artist and a Pratt & Venice alumna. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Diana. Um, uh, Sergio, continuing the tradition of uh, Venetian painting, is uh, painting a fresco, after all, in, in a villa on a river that continues on to a great metropolis. So in this case, it's the Hudson instead of the Brenta, but same problems. <laughs> anyway, okay, I'm going to share the screen now. <clears throat> I did it. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you. Anyway, so this is the Scuola del Santo in Pado, which is where uh, the fresco, the early frescoes of Titian are that um, this uh, this paper is about. Here we go. <laughs> okay, it's um, sorry. Joe, it's not, the arrows are not going to the next page. Uh, Adele, I think if you click, um, click on the slide itself, it should uh, advance. Okay. <gasps> okay. Oh, good. Now this is covered. Pardon me. You know, I, <laughs> now the, the gallery view is covering part of what I'm supposed to read. What do I do? <laughs> Oh dear. Is is this is this this may be power not PowerPoint, but um a different version? Is that this is this is what was okay. left for me to deal with. So no, I don't maybe I can go back. Let me Adele, if you're full screen, um hover over the gallery and click the smallest, it's like a flat line. And when you hover over to say hide thumbnail video, if you oh. click that, it will minimize the gallery view. Thank you so much, Diana. That that did it. <laughs> All right, excellent. Okay. All right. So Titian's 500 year secret. As a student with the Pratt and Venice program, I arrived in Padua eager to see the renowned frescoes by Giotto in the Scrivani Chapel and the early frescoes by Titian of the Miracles of Saint Anthony. Uh, in the Scuola del Santo, painted between April and December of 1511. They are 
the miracle of the newborn, the miracle of the healed foot, and the miracle of the jealous husband. Um, all right, this is the, <clears throat> the fresco, the miracle of the newborn son, which shows the saint presenting the newborn baby who speaks miraculously in defense of his mother who was being accused of adultery. Okay. Um, the next fresco is of the miracle of the healed foot in which the saint uh, restores the foot to a wrathful son who had kicked his mother <laughs> in anger and then cut off his foot uh, in remorse and uh, well the saint put it back. All right. The third miracle of uh, St. Anthony is uh, restoring the life of the innocent wife who was stabbed to death by the jealous husband, who in the background is kneeling to St. Anthony, asking him to restore his wife. Anyway, okay, so the miracle of the jealous husband. While viewing the fresco of the miracle of the jealous husband, something unusual caught my eye. I noticed that a large area in the middle of the fresco was raised several inches from the surface. I also realized that it was deliberately camouflaged by the illusionistic representations of the other volumes in the painting. I pointed this out to program director Dr. Diana Gisolfi. Look here, Diana. Titian built up the intonico, then sculpted it to perfectly describe the anatomy of the raised arm of the wife. I explained that having built up the three-dimensional forms of the arm, he proceeded to paint the shaded sides of these forms so that they matched in color tonality and values the ones he used in the rest of the painting. The jealous husband's upraised arm holding the dagger, whose volume is purely illusionistic, arguably looks as three-dimensional or even more so than that of the wife. The sculpted arm's actual shadow cast by the natural illumination in the room was perfectly matched by the shadows produced by the illusionistic light of the rest of the painting. Because of this, it flawlessly hid the real three-dimensional form among the illusionistic three-dimensional ones. Diana looked at the bump in amazement and agreed. This is big and not published. It is a new discovery. Congratulations, you must document. <clears throat> the following summer, after securing permission from the Art Confraternity, I returned armed with cameras, tripods, slave trigger servos, and some very sophisticated assistance from my 11-year-old daughter, Anna. A long day of careful work resulted in this conclusive photograph, which was subsequently published in the Art Bulletin in my article, New Findings in Titian's Fresco Technique, at the Scuola del Santo in Padua. Shot in raking light, the shadow cast by the projecting volume of the arm, it's much darker and longer than the adjacent illusionistically painted shadows. The photo clearly shows the actual three-dimensionality of the sculpted arm of the wife. Uh, now that I had evidence of the existence of the bas-relief element in the fresco, I still had to determine if it was Titian's doing and not a later addition. To make sure, I compared the brushwork, painting style, and mastery of execution of that portion of the fresco with those of the rest of the painting. I also compared them to the other two Titian frescoes painted in the same period, <clears throat> and located in this room. I found that they were consistent with all the rest of Titian's work in this Sala Priorale. Next, I meticulously examined <clears throat> the giornate and found that all had been painted by the same hand. I confirmed that the giornate were painted consecutively due to the manner in which they mended. A later edition would have shown obvious differences in the drawing of the edges. Once I had established that the real three-dimensional volume and the painted illusion of three-dimensional volume of the wife's upraised arm were both executed by the hand of Titian, 
the remaining que the question remaining was why was this done? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is the Fonda Kudai Tedeschi, which as um, Cynthia pointed out was a very important building at the time in, in Venice. So this was a particularly important commission as uh, the frescoes would uh, have decorated all the, the you know, open space of the facade. So before attempting to answer this question, which meant trying to get into the young Titian's head, I raced back to Venice to examine his earlier works. A good starting point was the series of frescoes that the youthful artist executed alongside the then better known Giorgione on the facade of the Fonda Codei Tedeschi, a prominent building on the Canal Grande. Of these, only fragments are extant, which are housed in the Cador. <clears throat> The Cador. <clears throat> so these are the fragments uh, that have been detached from what, what's left of them from the Fondaco facade. And we are speaking specifically about the Judith or Justicia, which is the one in the middle. <clears throat> um, La Tempesta by Giorgione. Giorgione, an older, well-established artist, had reached the top of the Venetian public's estimation with his recently unveiled painting, La Tempesta, now at the Galleria dell'Accademia in Venice. Contemporary accounts describe the further acclaim he gained from for the Fondaco facade decorations. The greatest admiration was for the figure of Judith, which was praised for the convincing representation of its volumes and which had been painted by the much younger Titian. <clears throat> Fortunately, this quality can still be observed in the severely damaged surviving frescoes uh, fragments in the Cador. Judith Justicia is the main figure in Titian's allegory of justice. In spite of the present ruinous state of the fresco fragment, the emphatically rendered volumes give the figure which leans outwards, the extended right arm holding a sword, the left a pair of scales, the feeling of a strong physical presence occupying a three-dimensional space. After a thorough examination, I found no sign of the use of raised forms anywhere in the fragment. Titian could obviously represent volume successfully by means of illusionistic pictorial means alone and had received ample recognition for it because of this fresco. <clears throat> I wondered about what might have motivated Titian to build up that real volume in the middle of a painting and then hide it so perfectly through painterly skill that no one had become aware of it in five centuries. I asked myself what might be going through the mind of an ambitious young man when only he knew of the extent of his powers as an artist. Surely he would wish to measure himself against the best artists in the world to know where he ranked. What challenges would attract his imagination? If according to the art criticism of his time, three-dimensionality was the holy grail of painting, then there was only one artist to beat. Shortly before Titian was offered his Scuola del Santo commission, Pope Julius at the Vatican had ordered that the first half of the Sistine Chapel ceiling paintings be open to the public. The Sistine Chapel ceiling. Contemporary accounts by Vasari and Condivi attest to the overwhelming universal admiration for these great frescoes by Michelangelo. Overnight, they were established as the new standard for the representation of three-dimensional volume in painting. So tremendous was their artistic impact that people traveled from all over Europe to see them. Artists copied them for their own study and disseminated them in their countries of origin. <clears throat> Drawings of Michelangelo's figures were coveted everywhere. This makes it highly likely that they would have been peddled in Venice as well. A copy of Michelangelo's fresco of the original sin is especially likely to have been seen by Titian. So this is a fragment of I mean, a detail of the fresco of the original sin from Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling frescoes. 
and uh, this shows the two states of Adam and Eve before and after um, eating the apple. So on the left, we see the original orientation of the fresco, and on the left, we see the figures flipped. <clears throat> Uh, here we see the, the figure of Eve uh, from Michelangelo's fresco and the figure of the wife in Titian's fresco. Um, they seem somewhat familiar. <clears throat> Noting this similarity, Creighton, among others, have suggested that Titian could have based the pose of the wife in his jealous husband fresco on that of Eve in Michelangelo's original sin, but flipped. If he did use it, or the similarity is just a coincidence, we'll never know for sure. What we do have a basis to suspect is that in the Scuola Frescos, the young Titian was responding to a challenge, not from the established artists of Venice, but from Rome, specifically from the godlike Michelangelo. I am proposing that the young Titian aware of his growing powers of pictorial representation, reacted to Michelangelo's immense success in painting the illusion of three-dimensionality on the Sistine Chapel ceiling by creating the ultimate test of volume representation. He could not compare his work with Michelangelo's directly, so he would bypass this altogether and measure his painted illusion of volume with three-dimensional reality itself. Juxtaposing a real volume and painted illusions of volume in the same painting, he set up an experiment to test whether he could paint volumes as lifelike as the real thing. <clears throat> the more they were perceived as indistinguishable, the more the test proved him right. He may never have imagined that five centuries of visitors to the Scuola del Santo and innumerable viewers through photographic imagery would continue to make his argument. After such extensive affirmation, I can hope that he might not have minded my discovering his secret. I fantasize that he may even have been pleased to know that it was a countryman of his and a Venetian school painter that discovered his experiment, a discovery that in no way diminishes his achievement, but rather enhances our fascination with Titian the man. That's it. Okay. Brava, thank you. Do people have questions? I don't know, if, Adele, if you can be responsible for answering the questions, but if people I have questions. answer some things. <laughs> <No. laughs> so well, what, what I can't answer, you can. <laughs> so, okay. If, I'll try. There's just one, one um, observation to add. Um, of course, there were engravings after the, right. um, after the Sistine ceiling that were distributed almost immediately. And there's plenty of evidence that they made their way to Venice. Of course, they would have. And so, um, and so he, he, that's a very convincing comparison to me. And so I think he would have seen an engraving um, after right. yeah. the ceiling. Um, which explains why it was flipped, right? <laughs> that too, that's true. So that's, that would make uh, perfect sense. Yeah, so I, that's a little footnote to, to Sergio's paper. It's also something artists tend to do when they steal somebody's drawing. <laughs> so I can't change it, but well, I'll flip it. <laughs> it's like, or they trace it. And, you know, so that that is uh, a sort of a typical thing to do when you're using someone else's uh, figure. Mm -hmm. um, well, also using their own. They would often take a drawing, flip it, oh, and use right. it in a, in a painting. This Recycle is, it. No, they all did it. Uh, Tintoretto <laughs> might be the most famous for doing that, but yes, they all did it. That's right. Oh, boy. So a question from Jesse. I would like to know more about how this use of built-up pastilia can or has been compared with the common quattrocento use typically seen in metal objects such as swords or scales, et cetera? Right. Well, for one thing, this is not an added material such as would happen in the, in the medieval ones. Uh, this was the, the last layer of the, of the intonaco, the intonacchio itself, 
Well, possibly in his case, it would have been part of the intonaco as well, but it is the material into which the paint is actually going to, going to sink in and become part of. So it's what he's painting on, the, the, you know, the, um, the support. It's not, not added later and then painted on. It's a little, little bit different. He, he had to do it quickly. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, a question from Joe. Maybe a practical question about the actual investigation of the Scuola de San, Santo Fresco. Mm. How did Sergio and you and your daughter get permissions, for example, et cetera? Uh, well, um, Sergio is is from there, and they're yeah, they they get very friendly. I mean, he just well for okay. Another thing is he uh, he is. Uh, He's very good friends with the Benedictine abbot in Venice. So they could just talk about that. They have coffee all the time. And so when they, it, when he would just say, oh, you know, I was talking to so-and-so, you know, and he said, yeah, it's, it's very easy when you're from there. So they were very friendly and they just let, sure, go ahead, get up on a ladder and look at it. You know, it was no problem. They'd bring somebody to help him. It was just very, um, so Anna was holding, no, I wasn't there. This was just Sergio and Anna. I was doing something else. So she's holding up the, the, you know, the, the flash servos and it was amazing, but yeah, no, no, the, 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 um, the confraternity was like more than happy. They were like, oh, sure. This great. Fine. No problem at all. <laughs> Joe, as this sounds exactly like the Benito. It, it, yes, that's true. I'd hate to try to, to, to try anything like that myself. <laughs> Say like, sorry, you got to go do this and that, and it'd be like really complicated. <clears throat> His name is Morosini. That's right. Yeah. And that he could he could speak a Venet an old Veneto dialect, yes. which mm -hmm. not everybody in Venice. I mean, Sergio got into whatever he wanted. He got it. How did he get to be an intern in in, in the superintendence? You know, he he could. He had diplomatic skills, which had been honed by being a diplomat. So that's right. It's like he had every every advantage in doing this. It was funny, but <clears throat> it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. Well, yeah. Harm and connections get you far, certainly. <laughs> Question from Victoria: Did Sergio find any surviving cartoons or preparatory sketches for this? fresco that might have emphasized the shading of the arm or alluded to his plans for a dimensional buildup? Actually, no, I don't think he found anything. I'm, I, I, not that I, not that I know of. No. That's a great think, question though. Right? I don't think so. And, and these are very early. So maybe there were some and they didn't survive, but because of the, the whole idea of the secrecy, I doubt that he would put it down. Even if he did do a preliminary drawing, I don't think he would show, you know, that he intended to do this to anyone. Well, there are, there are sketches re related to it. Um, there's a sketch related to it that's different. It shows it, it shows that flip, the, the husband and wife are flipped in an early, in a, an early, early thought for it, which is just done in pen. And in the other paintings, it frescoes in by Titian, there are, um, they have been studied in terms of the giornate um, that it took to, to make them. So it's sort of amazing that it wasn't discovered by anyone before Sergio's observation, but it's, it's totally convincing. But um, it's because he, Titian was hiding it. He really, you know, he's very, very smart. He can hide anything he really wanted to. No, this this uh, raised portion is really big. It's the size of a person's actual arm, and it's raised more than two inches in spots. It is really a, a huge thing, and you do not notice it at all. Right. It's, it's, a, it's very strange. It is, and it was a definitely a cool thing that he discovered it. <laughs> we, have, we have to, um, it's 324. Six, and it's 325 is the time for Diana Bauer's talk. So we're going to move on. And um, I think, you know, any questions that come from any of these um, engaging and challenging talks uh, that people want to go more on, we can do at the end. 